So uh, I'll get that started as well. Uh, well, good morning. I'm Cindy Nellis, and uh, I'm the director here at the Small Business Development Center at Clarion University, and we welcome you. Uh, today, March 16th, we celebrate National Small Business Development Center Day. We call it SBDC Day, and it's a day where we uh, celebrate and showcase the impact that our program nationally has on our small businesses. So we're excited to host today's webinar in celebration of that. Uh, if you uh, have any questions for me, uh, if you're struggling to hear or anything like that, if you'd like to have your microphone unmuted um, throughout today, we encourage you to use the chat to communicate with me, your host. Right now, we have muted you and your videos are disabled. Um, but if you, um, you can certainly raise your hand with questions. We want this to be an interactive uh, webinar for sure. So we're going to encourage you to use the chat to, um, to, to pose questions, but we are happy to um, unmute you as well to make it easier for you to talk and ask questions. Um, we have recorded the webinar and we will be sharing all of our slides. That's usually a question that we have here at the very beginning. Uh, I believe that's it. Let me go ahead and, and just quickly get started and uh, I'll shift here where um, we are hosting uh, customer analytics. Um, but we, before we get started, I just want to introduce you to the Small Business Development Center. Um, our program, we're grant funded and our mission is to help businesses start, grow and succeed. Uh, in Pennsylvania, we're a part of a national network um, of uh, national network as well as in Pennsylvania, we're a network of 16 centers. Um, our mission, uh, again, is to help businesses start and grow. And what we do is we provide education, information, and tools to help you, our small business owners, make better business decisions. We do that through one-on-one -on -one business consulting services. That's where we spend most of our time. Uh, and it's important for you to know that our services are provided at no cost. Uh, and uh, it is confidential. Uh, everything that we do is confidential. Uh, I noted here some of the things that uh, we spend a lot of our time on, just some big, bigger kind of topics. Uh, we work with those looking to start a business as well as those looking for funding, uh, looking to analyze their financials, QuickBooks and the like. Uh, who we work with, we work with, uh, again, the look, people looking to start a business as well as existing for-profit small businesses. And to us, a small business is any business with less than 500 employees. We also offer training like today. And uh, we uh, give you two websites. One is ours and one is our statewide web website because all 16 SBDCs uh, provide training. And right now, most of it is virtual. And so you can capitalize on our training events as well as any other training event the SBDC is hosting across the state. So this is our map and you can find your county and identify the SBDC that is uh, that covers and services your county. You'll note that our network, we all the SBDCs are hosted at institutions of higher education. So we uh, integrate our services uh, as well with the university communities and we utilize um, resources that our universities have to serve you as well. Uh, we're funded through state and federal tax dollars from the Small Business Administration on the federal level and through the Department of Community and Economic Development on a state level. And of course, every host institution does provide an investment into our program as a way of serving you in our communities. Today, I'd like to uh, introduce you to our speaker, Dr. J. Anadatha uh, is an associate professor in the Department of Com Computer Information Science. Here at Clarion University, he has developed the department's first fully online Master of Science program in applied data analytics, which is ranked 11th in the nation for the best online masters in analytics management. He has over 36 years of a professional experience spanning research and development, technology consulting, business leadership, and academia. His domain expertise includes healthcare, public sector, defense research, higher education, and technology. Dr. Anadatha founded and operates an IT consulting firm, Better Minds Consulting, and provides information technology project services to small and medium businesses since 2006. 
Um, so I'd like to turn it over to Dr. J. And um, Dr. J, I'd like for you to share your screen. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, is my screen visible now to the participants? Let's see here. Yes, it is. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on customer analytics. I want to thank uh, Cindy for the kind introduction. So without uh, spending much time on uh, introducing myself, I just want to tell you that uh, you know, um, I enjoy um, mentoring small and medium businesses through my consulting firm and also uh, through the university, of, uh, through the Clarion University uh, projects like Clarion SPDC. And I want to kick off this customer analytics uh, webinar by using the motto of uh, the SPDC itself, which is helping businesses start, grow, and prosper. And how do businesses grow? How do they prosper? And the key is the customers. So this webinar is all about understanding your customers, uh, knowing your customer, targeting your customer, showcasing your products as they would prefer, and then capitalizing by providing amazing services. So with that, let me introduce to you the uh, topics that we plan to cover. We'll start off with the definitions, at least the practical definitions of what customer analytics is all about. And why should companies focus on Customer analytics. How does it impact the business performances? And everything starts with data. So data is the new oil, as uh, people say in the digital world that we live in. And it's always better to know what kind of customer data uh, that you need to acquire to start your analytics projects. And um, Probably, you know, most of the companies have invested in customer databases. I mean, databases where you have the transactional data, but we live in this digital media where the data is coming from multiple sources. So we'll consider all those customer data sources that you can think of. And then how do you kick off the customer experience journey? Like what are the processes involved? And it's not enough to have the processes, but you also need metrics. So we'll focus on some of the metrics like the net promoter score, computer, uh, the customer satisfaction and engagement scores. But above all, the most tangible metric, which is the customer lifetime value. So I will probably explain to you briefly how you can uh, set up the framework for carrying out your customer analytics initiatives. But everything starts off with how do you actually um, not only you capture the customer data, but how do you target your customers? Because obviously companies just spend money by this uh, marketing uh, research data from third party companies, but how do you target your customers? So there's this technique called as customer segmentation, which is very, very popularly used by marketing executives. We'll consider them in the discussions. I also want to uh, introduce to you the three types of analytics that typically fall under the customer analytics, which is the descriptive, the predictive, and the prescriptive analytics, and how artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques are being widely used to automate and um, accelerate your analytics uh, project. I wanted to briefly introduce to you some of the tools uh, that are popularly used. Now, within the uh, timeline that we have for this lecture, I cannot uh, you know, give all the tools that possible. At least let's uh, cover some of those uh, broad uh, tools that are popularly known and how uh, you can implement some strategies to improve your customer retention, increase the customer lifetime value, especially you know, using techniques like the subscription models. And then we'll finally conclude with uh, the trends uh, in customer analytics as well as what are the benefits of customer analytics. So let's all try to understand customer data analytics or customer analytics. I'm sure some of you are already doing this, but see if maybe some of these uh, definitions make any uh, sense to you. It is a systematic examination 
of a company's customer information and customer behavior. Customer information is what you're collecting through your uh, systems, CRM systems, your transactional systems, but also customer behavior, which is their browsing, their online, how they visit your website and all those things. And you use this to identify, attract and retain the most profitable customers. Obviously, there can be millions visiting your company website, but are, are they becoming your, they're probably potential customers, but are they, uh, are you able to convert them into a paid customer? The other definition is, it is the process of analyzing historical customer behavior. So you're looking at your customer behavior over a period of time, the last year, last few quarters, or the last five, 10 years. And um, so the historical behavior, which is what we call as descriptive analytics, what happened, why it happened, uh, where do they shop? So that's all you can capture from the data that you have to derive actionable customer segments. So you use that, you use the customer data, customer behavior, customer preferences, and you can create your target audience. Okay, it's like the airline industry. They can uh, segment their customers into uh, you know, um, high um, flying customers, low flying customers, or occasional flyers. So that's the kind of segmentation that I'm talking about. And this process, it helps companies to predict future outcomes. So based on the historical past, now you'll be able to make some meaningful data-driven predictions about the future, which is what we call as predictive analytics. But when you predict something that's going to happen based on the past, you also have to take some actionable steps to realize those predictive goals. And so that's what we call as prescriptive analytics, where you can personalize your customer experience by targeting them, showing them highly relevant offers at the right time and at the right place. So it's like when you're on Amazon Prime, you're browsing for uh, a television, um, an OLED TV or something like that, and then you make personalized recommendations to the customer. Or say you're watching uh, movies on Netflix or TV shows on Netflix or Prime or Hulu, it makes personalized recommendations to you based on your past shows or movies that you've seen, the genres and all that. So that's your uh, prescriptive and they make those recommendations and then they predict that you are likely to watch those movies or TVs or buy those products recommended. And that way you will be able to uh, make sales. So let's uh, start off this webinar to have a quick uh, response from the participants. I see about 31 have already logged in. So if you can use the chat box and type in, what exactly do you want to know about your customers? So let me read the chats as I come by. Will they buy a pet loss gift for a friend or family member? Excellent. How to attract younger buyers? That's again, your segmentation. You want to target younger folks. Age, preferences, buying habits, absolutely true. Purchasing habits, which is what we will be probably looking at. How they found us and more about who they are. Excellent. So this is where, like, you now you can probably do some Google Analytics and you'll be able to find out, which I'm going to cover briefly. How loyal they are. Obviously, that will be based on um, the purchasing they do and their lifetime value. What are their future needs? This is an excellent question. So it's not enough if you have loyal customers, but you also would like to know what will be their future requirements 
that's what like you know companies like Apple, Starbucks, they do, and they try to present those products. So it leads to new product development, um, their needs, what products are they interested in, how much are they willing to pay, how much are they willing to pay. That's very important, absolutely, because if you have a high price product, you need to know that your customer segment, uh, the target customer audience, are willing to pay those items, right? So that's important. And um, how did they hear about our business exactly? That's about the channels from where they come from. I want to know my customer business interests, needs, part of strategy to deliver, enhance my business services to them exactly. How to continually keep their customer engagement in a digital online business with no physical customer interaction. Absolutely true, because in a face-to-face -face interaction, you can always you know, uh, you can perceive the customer's uh, body language. You know whether the customer is happy or not. You can take immediate steps, but in an online interaction, that's missing. So how do you keep them uh, glued to your products and services? What other pet-related products are they interested in? Exactly, that's your recommendation. So they want to buy some system. How can you recommend some of the other products? So that's something that you can use it. Then what can I do to persuade them to purchase now instead of later. Exactly. This is what I'm going to be touching in what I call as a cart abandonment. In many cases, online e-commerce, people go put all the items in the shopping cart, but they don't check out. So you would like them to buy now instead of later. So how can you get that uh, purchase? What type of service they want in my feed, whether it's animal transporting, how to satisfy that for word of mouth advertising or good reviews. Obviously, this is where your sentiment analysis comes into play. So um, I think uh, we have really so many comments. I want to part uh, thank the participants for these excellent responses. Anything else comes by, Cindy, you can probably let me know as I proceed. So with that, let's uh, move on to the uh, impact that um, why do we focus on customer analytics? So all of you, you gave your questions, what your expectations are, you really want to know all these things about your customer. And so that itself shows why customer analytics is important, but let me probably put it in simple English. We live in a very highly connected world. What do I mean by connected world? So much of data is being generated, your mobile phones, mobile apps, websites, you are, uh, even the cars have a lot of sensor data, not just the self-driving cars. Every car has got sensors uh, that's generating data. And companies like Walmart, Target, they use this uh, RFID tags that's generating data. Then you have got locational data. So much of data is coming in. So we live in this massive big data world and companies can use these uh, data points, data proactively to understand customer behavior, customer preferences, what customers want, and they can make informed decisions. Because what is data? Data is fact. We say data is the new asset for companies because it is a digital asset, it is the new oil. The more you mine the data, the more you will know the customers, the more you'll be able to present your products. You can do your upselling, cross-selling, if you see negative reviews, you'll be able to take immediate steps to rectify them and retain your customer, and you'll be able to improve your bottom line. But let's look at some uh, data from benchmark surveys. So here is a McKinsey benchmarking survey. Obviously, this was a, way back in 2013, but it's still relevant. And they spoke to some of the top executives in about 400 companies, top large international companies. Okay, and they try to measure the vital KPIs, key performance indicators. You can look at this um, um, bar chart. The dark blue is for those customers or companies who did not use customer analytics extensively. But the lighter blue is for those who have used extensively customer analytics. You can see immediately there's an 126 percent increase in profit, 131% increase in sales, 
186 percent in growth of sales, and the return on investment is about 132 percent. So what do we see here? You can see, for example, in terms of sales, 50 percent of customer analytics champions. We call them as champions because these companies they use customer analytics extensively. 50 percent of those uh, champions they are likely to have sales well above their competitors. Okay, because competitors they are having only 22 percent versus 50%. So this is one case. Let's look at the other one. This is how customer analytics impact the customer life cycle. So let's look at the strategic as well as the tactical KPI. So let's look at the strategic KPIs. This is what you know your CEOs, your marketing guys will be interested in. Customers acquired, customers retain. It's not enough if you just acquire, but you want to retain them. Customer loyalty. Somebody wanted to know about customer loyalty. So customer loyalty and customer satisfaction. So we'll look at how you can measure them, but let's look at these KPIs. You can see those who use customer analytics, 23 times more customers acquired, 6.5 times re more retention, nine times more loyalty. Why? Because your data is going to show you how likely this customer is going to churn, how likely they are not going to reduce their subscriptions. And if you can take some preventive proactive steps, you reach out to the customer, you throw in some uh, you know, bonuses, some benefits and all that stuff, uh, and you, know, you can retain the customers and convert your monthly to the annual subscription models. All those things can be done. And then more than anything else, as somebody mentioned, your customer reviews, like people are buying everything online. So before they buy, they are looking at the review. You have 10 positive reviews, but there are at least two negative reviews and those two negative reviews can be a showstopper. So when you see these reviews, be respectful. Get back to the customer, reach out to them, resolve the problem, escalate the problem with your company, your customer support team, give them more training if required, and improve your customer satisfaction. And the customer who wants to really leave you or do not want to buy the product, they come back and buy your product. So these are all the things that your customer analytics can fetch you based on the data that you use. Let's look at the tactical KPIs. Sales to existing customers, 7.4 times increase by using customer analytics. You are making sales to existing customers. So, how do you retain your existing customer? You can do cross-selling, upselling. So that's something that you'll be able to uh, use. And somebody said, how much uh, the customer is going to buy? You'll be able to do this analytics and you'll be able to find out what segments these customers fall in or the high price item buyers or the low price buyers. And accordingly, you'll be able to bump up the sales to existing customers. And then customer profitability can be increased about 18.8 times. How? Upselling, cross-selling, and all that stuff. And you can increase your value delivered to customers 15 times. Value, price, shipping, promptness, customer support, all those things are a value add to the customers. And then you can also migrate your customers to the profitable segments. Maybe they came in like, you know, buying a low-end uh, mobile phone, but then you can move them to the profitable, um, you know, phones or the iPads or, or MacBooks or Macs or something like that. So 21 times you'll be able to migrate to profitable. So now these are actual numbers from uh, these uh, uh, managed top champions of customer analytics. So now let's come back to how do I get all the data about the customer. Because I said data is fact. You want to know everything about your customer. So let's look at what are the customer data that uh, you can probably categorize. Now, all of us know you go to your shop, Walmart, Target, you buy something or you buy online, there's a point of sale, that's uh, one data, the transactional data. But that's not the end of it. In fact, that is a minuscule data that will help you improve your business bottom line. So. Let's look at all the aspects. First is know your customer. That's the basic customer identity data. Demographics, contact, like somebody said, how do I target uh, youngsters, young buyers? Like you know, all those things you'll be able to uh, 
uh, know, have the demographic data, contacts, emails, phone calls, what channels do the youngsters, they are very fond of uh, TikTok or Instagram, right? And then you have older people who use Facebook or LinkedIn or something like that. So how do you target all those things can be useful? The next one is the engagement, right? How do you engage with your customers? What are the touch points? Your social media, your website, your mobile apps, which is very commonly used, customer service interactions, you know, bot, chats, all those things. Then your behavior, how customer spending behavior, purchasing data. So that's your products through browsing, to transactional point of sale data and all that. Finally, is the most key. This is the showstopper or the deal maker, which is the attitudinal data, customer feedback, sentiments on your products, are they happy, are they sad, are they okay kind of uh, with your products? All these things coming from your social media posts, your surveys, everything. So I can broadly categorize this data as the pre-purchase data. So before a customer makes a purchase, all your marketing and all those channels that you use, word of mouth included, then your purchase data, you know, online, offline purchases, and most importantly is the post-purchase. Okay, you don't want the buyer's remorse, right? So your post-purchase is very important. That's your post-sales, customer surveys, surveys, um, the social media you know, follow-up, the loyalty programs, right? Somebody buys your product, how do you throw in some loyalty programs? How do you continue to engage with the customer? So all these things would be beneficial. And somebody said like, no, how can I showcase other products, pet products or something like that? There was a question. So here it is, uh, now based on like, you know, customers coming onto your e-commerce website and you know, they are trying to search for something you would have seen in um, Amazon and all that immediately, you know, you are searching for say a laptop and a speaker, and then automatically it says people who bought these items also bought headphones, and then finally the customer makes a purchase, probably they bought a laptop, which is quite a, a big purchase. And then of course, there are people who viewed a monitor and a headphone, and uh, you make recommendations to speakers and the laptops, finally they end up buying the, uh, uh, the speakers, right? So these are all some of the things that like somebody asks about the pet products. This is how you will be able to, you have to implement your recommendation engines. Now, recently I was shopping at uh, Costco. You know, I always like to go in, but now thanks to the pandemic, you know, we had to make some online purchases through Instacart. And so I thought I finished my you know, shopping list, but then when I was about to check out, it, it tells me, hey, did you get everything you need? And it is showing me some of these products. How did they get it? It says your personalized shopping list, just in case. How did they personalize? They looked at my past purchasing data because I'm a Costco member. So they see all my transactional data or what items I bought and all that. And they must have seen, I'm buying these items once a month or twice a month. And based on that, they feel some of these items are missing and immediately they're able to do that. So similarly, whether it's your pet products or something like that, you know what is the consumption cycle and you know the buying cycle of the customer, then you can personalize and recommend them and say, hey, did you forget this one? And that's one way you'll be able to uh, incre increase your sales. So having seen all these things, now let's start the customer journey or the customer experience journey. It's a process, okay? It all starts with knowing your customer. Understand your customer audience, which obviously I'm going to tell you how you can know your target audience. And then these days, what is more important is you don't want general recommendation to the customer. The customer wants to be valued um, as a gold mine. So they want you to personalize their choice. So when you go to Netflix, it says, these are the TV shows or movies recommended for you and based on your past viewing history. Similarly, shopping behavior, they make recommendations. So you try to make personalized preferences, right? That's one thing which is very, very critical. Then 
you have to set up your benchmarks. You promise the customer what you would deliver. So define what customers can expect from you. So whether it's Airbnb customer or Tesla or Apple or a Starbucks customer, these companies, later on you'll see why they have great loyalty is because they define what customers expect from them. They define the metrics, they meet and exceed those expectations. So that's a promise you make to the customer. Then you start the journey. You create the roadmap and that is through the touch points, your social media, mobile apps and all those stuff. It's not enough if you create all these benchmarks, you need to measure them. So what methodology, how frequently will you have customer service? Again, you don't want to overwhelm the customer. So obviously after the uh, purchase immediately, you can send out a survey and maybe a follow-up or something like that. And then you also define some metrics. And then you carry out your analysis. And when you do the analysis, based on your customer reviews and all that, or customer calls, customer support calls, you'll be able to find out there are some complaints, repeated complaints, and you're going to escalate them. You have to make improvements to your process, your post uh, service uh, follow-ups and all those things, and you can make improvements. So this is what I call as a customer experience strategy, which is a process driven. Now let's uh, focus on those metrics, which will help you measure your customer happiness. Okay, it's based on the customer feedback. And um, one thing that all of you may be familiar with, uh, unless you are totally new to this topic, is what we call as a net promoter score. Who are your customers who are promoting your company products and services, okay? So a typical question would be in a survey, how likely are you to recommend us to your friend or a colleague? So whatever may be the size of your company, this is a very, very important question uh, that the survey will include on the mobile device or through an email survey or whatever it is. And you can see in this uh, case, the responses you see about six red um, responses, they are not happy with you. There are only two greens. Those greens are your promoters. They are your ambassadors. So what should you do? I mean, this is not rocket science. You have to increase the number of greens, minimize the number of reds so that your net promoter scores are going to improve. And this net promoter score, people who are promoting your company and products and services, not only they buy your product, they also are doing the word of mouth recommendation about your product. It is measurement of your customer loyalty, okay? And because they are loyal customers, they are not going to leave you. It will re reduce your customer churn. The other question that you all of you can include in your survey, I'm sure all of you do have this, especially in the e-commerce setting, is how was your experience? Whether they visited your website or whether they bought some items on your e-commerce site, how was your experience, okay? And you can see the emojis, it tells you, um, these are all something that you can use for sentiment analysis. And this is a measure of your customer satisfaction and happiness. And once you have this question and response, you can have a follow-up question, an open-ended question, and you're asking the customer, why do you feel so? Why are you happy? Why are you sad? Why do you have no comments about your experience? All those things can help you with that. And then let's look at the third one. It's also very important. So a customer is coming onto your website. They want to browse your product to look for some information. Uh, or they go to your shop or online. You know, the effort involved in locating the products that they need to make a decision and make a purchase, what is the effort involved? So the question is, to what extent do you agree or disagree with the following statement? And the statement is, the company made it easy for me to handle my issues. Imagine you bought a new iPhone and you call Apple customer service. So how quickly you were able to have a customer support person to assist you, guide you, resolve your issues, what time it took, 
or did they pass on the buck? Did you call someone, they passed on to um, customer support team, they passed on to escalation team. All those efforts which are involved, what was the waiting period? How long did they have to wait to talk to a, a human rep? All those things are customer efforts. So these are all the areas where all of you can focus on. And I've given you um, a link here. Uh, it's a tool, Zonka Feedback. Maybe some of these companies may be using it and you will be able to run surveys to calculate your net promoter score or customer satisfaction, customer effort score. They have the templates for the surveys. You will be able to use them uh, extensively. And um, I also forgot to say that if anyone has any questions, you can always put it on the chat and then, uh, Cindy can help me if uh, I'm you no know, going too fast or something like that, or you have some questions. But otherwise, I will do. I will have a pass uh, after some time in case you have questions. And uh, when we talk of net promoter score, I said you would like to have always customers who promote your products, so you want to bump up your net promoter score. How do you benchmark this score? Okay, the benchmarking is based on industry vertical. So if you are a hotel industry, you have to align with the hotel industry net promoter scores. If you are in the travel, again, with the travel. And then this net promoter score is also based on the culture, cultural traits of uh, your target audience. So there are those countries which are very conservative. Then there are those countries which are very liberal. Liberal countries, you know, they can on a scale of one to 10, they can give you 10, the highest, if they're very happy. But some conservative audience, even if they're very happy, they can give you a seven out of 10. So all those things matter. And uh, this net promoter score, is, as I said, is a very uh, key metrics, which measures your customer satisfaction, customer overall experience, and it also helps your customer engagement management initiatives. So these are all the things. Now, in terms of what score is good for you, right? Here is Bain and Company. They set up this uh, benchmark net promoter score system. And what they say is, any net promoter score above zero is good because at least you don't have negative opinion about your products and services. But anything about 20 is okay, I would say. It's okay, right? Now you can survive in the business. But Bain and Company says, if you can aim for a net promoter score of 50, that's excellent. So you will definitely have loyal customers, they are spreading word of mouth, they're promoting your products, that's good. But then we are going to be looking at companies which have scores around 70 and above, and if it's above 80, it's world-class, okay? So as I said, look at this image. These are your detractors, try to reduce them as best as you can. Promoters, they are your ambassadors, they are going to sell your products and services, and that's where you have to focus on. And let's look at some of these companies. Now, obviously, when I talk about customer loyalty, you know, you'll always look at companies like Apple, Tesla, Starbucks, right? Let's look at those companies. Apple, net promoter score 63. Okay, this would have been like two years ago. Amazon, 62. Netflix, 68. Tesla has a whopping 96 net promoter score. Perfect, 100 almost. Starbucks, 77, close to 80. Airbnb, 74, okay? And what does it indicate? 73 peers, now let's look at Amazon Prime. 73% of people who try Amazon Prime, they try, you know, you have a 30 day free trial, but 73% of them, they convert into paid members. Now here is the kicker. After the first year, 91% of the members renew their subscription for another year. And, 96% of those members who are already in the second year, they pay for a third year. How is that Amazon Prime in such a competitive e-commerce market are they able to do? And Amazon Prime recently has increased their subscription. How are they increasing the subscription but still giving a better return to the customer, adding more features and resources to them and customer is able to get recoup their cost within a couple of purchases, right? Something like that. Now let's look at Tesla. 
91% of Tesla owners said they would buy again from this brand. Now, what else do you want? If your customer is coming back and say, I will always buy your product, you don't need anything better than that, right? Of course, you don't take them for granted. And 25% of Tesla owners also said they don't even think of any other brand than Tesla. Now, talk of customer loyalty, talk of customer net promoter score, these are your indicators, okay? And why are this, uh, and how does the net promoter score get impacted? By this, why these companies have great value numbers, simple and reliable products. They make the whole experience with your products, your interactions, they make everything very easy. Reliability, product reliability is very important. So that is quality services, quality product, quick responses, amazing customer service. And obviously, you know, whether it's Apple or Starbucks or Netflix, all these people like you know, they give, they give their customers innovative products and solutions. Okay. And that's one of the reasons they have a high customer loyalty. Dr. J. Uh, yes. So looking at a net promoter score, we have a question that focuses in on, you know, as a small business or even a startup, um, how, how do you relate kind of, how do you relate this to what a small business was, would focus on to score high? in this. Oh, uh, so the, the question is to get this mm -hmm. information and promote our products successfully, should we use a marketing firm? They're a startup. They don't have those kinds of funds. So what else could be done? That's the specific question. Absolutely. Uh, great question. And uh, obviously uh, using a, a consulting firm, uh, you know, people who can give you assured returns, like you no, know, obviously you look at their track record and they can always present numbers of how they bumped up a customer who had a, a zero to 10 NPS, how they were able to increase it to uh, say 40, 30 or 40 numbers and a company of related size, small companies, um, what is doable and all those things. So obviously you now using their marketing consulting firm uh, will be uh, the way to go. And um, obviously like you no know, cost effective implementation of those strategies um, uh, that will definitely help you uh, improve your net promoter score. Absolutely. And if you have a strong data science, data analytics team in house, then they probably will be able to help you out. But if you want to really quickly ramp up your numbers, um, you obviously have to find out what are your drawbacks? What are the reviews? Uh, why people have those re negative uh, review uh, view of your product or service or something like that. You got to look into that. But obviously your um, marketing consultant or these people will be able to tell you what is wrong with your system right now, like where you're losing your customer, why they have a negative view uh, or not so positive view. And then they'll be able to give you the strategies to implement. Absolutely. Did I answer the question for the participant? Um, I believe so, but I guess I I will also mention, um, you know, if they don't have the money to purchase to to pull in a marketing firm, um, then what do they what do they what what could they do? And and you know, there are obviously rating sites that. Um, that possibly could be used that they could watch too. Now I, I did, un, um, someone raised their hand, so I wanna make sure that they get a chance to ask a question. Please. Um, while we um, see if um, they, the person that raised their hand would like to speak, we have another question about would SurveyMonkey be a good option? Excellent. Yeah. SurveyMonkey is a very, very good option because they do have a free version 
and uh, you will be able to uh, periodically, you know, conduct, conduct surveys with your target audience. And um, it is uh, not only enough if you can do the survey, Survey Monkey also gives you the analysis, but it's all how you can carry out the analysis and how you are able to uh, take those insights and implement those changes. So survey is the, customer, is the data collection part of it, right? Which is good. Survey Monkey is a great tool. I use it uh, all the time. And uh, I would always recommend small businesses because I also you know, started a small business IT consulting firm. I will always look for open source, free tools uh, to get a feel of it, right? But survey is data collection. And then how do you analyze and get the metrics? And then the third star is based on the intelligence you gain, how are you going to implement immediate changes and you can um, implement those changes, conduct a survey again, see uh, those changes implemented are able to satisfy your customer. Are they able to come back to you and say, yeah, my problem has been resolved um, and uh, I wish to continue to you know, subscribe to your products or services like that. So obviously, yes, SurveyMonkey can be an excellent tool. Thanks, Dr. J, I think we're good. Thank you. Now, I also wanted to give you uh, some of these uh, companies can be worried, like especially in the e-commerce space, you can you know, worry. There are some external factors which can lower the net promoter score. For example, you know, let's look at the pandemic last two years. Let's look at these numbers, how it changed by industry. You can lo look at these big numbers, negative 28, negative 28, 28, 24. What are those companies? Hotels and rooms, okay? You've got the airline industry, credit card industry, rental cars. Okay, so let me all ask you a question. Why did this happen? And the answer is obvious. It is the impact of COVID-19. People are not able to travel, even if they want to. And people who have booked their travel and hotels and vacations, they all had to cancel them. And that's one of the reasons that like no NPS has come down. So now the good news is, if it is just the pandemic, which probably brought you down, then obviously uh, prior to the pandemic, if you had a good NPS, you are absolutely on track to uh, get it back. But that's something that is also a speculative one because Today, people have been shopping last two years using Instacart, right? I was going to Costco, but last two years, I feel like you know, it's better to order on Instacart. I still would like to go out to the mall, have a walk, but I'm happy to buy them you now from Amazon Prime or Costco online delivered through Instacart. So it's possible that people may you know, uh, have a change of uh, shopping behavior. Not that they're going to stop buying your product, but the modus operandi, how do they buy? Do they visit the stores or are they going to buy online? Those things can be um, changing. So pandemic obviously is going to change the way we live in my opinion, and uh, that could impact some of uh, the scores. But if you are doing quite well on the net promoter score prior to pandemic, you're more likely to do well post pandemic too, as long as your customers have not run away from you, okay? Now, all the metrics that I talk to you, they're all kind of, uh, you know, uh, some of them are intangibles, but they do impact your uh, sales and revenues. And uh, they're also kind of a qualitative assessment, right? But let's look at the real numbers. Your company, your C, your C level executives, your marketing guys, what they're interested in are numbers, right? That's delivered through this metric called the customer lifetime value or lifetime value of customer, any way it is, it's the customer lifetime value, which is when you acquire a new customer, how many purchases on an average the customer can make, how often do they make periodically, per month, per week, per year, whatever it is, and how long are they likely to buy your products and customers? So based on that, the, the product of all these three factors is your customer lifetime value. So this is a more tangible number 
a key metric that companies are always interested in because it shows uh, whether you are able to acquire or recoup the cost that you have spent on the customer acquisition. So it's a measure of customer acquisition, but it's also a measure of customer retention because the longer your customers are buying your product, your churn period is not a threat anymore, right? So unlike the net promoter score, which is, I would call it as a qualitative metric, the customer lifetime value is absolutely quantitative. This is your numbers that companies are worried about, okay? And so I don't think companies should be really you know, taken away by the very first purchase a customer makes. Rather, they should be looking at the long-term return on invest, right? And uh, so, for example, you have a customer who's spending $100 and never buys any product. Compare that customer with another customer who is making $100 purchases every month for, say, one year. Now, which customer is more valuable to you? So you can call those customers as profitable customers, and that's where you, know, you also should be able to focus on. And uh, not only that, the customer lifetime value metrics will also help your marketing team which target audience they have to choose. Okay, you may have a million customers. Are you going to be running promotions to a million? Or you can do some customer segmentation and say, okay, these are my frequent flyers, about 300,000 customers. I'm going to target these 300,000 customers. So these are all the strategies that you know, companies will be interested in. And... Um, Let's see how the CLV, the customer lifetime value impacts your business decisions, especially the marketing decisions. So this curve is something all of you can easily relate to. So here is, you have a customer who just joined you, you have spent X amount of dollars, okay? And to recoup that X amount of dollars, say like $300 you have spent for getting a new customer. And to recoup that 300 customers, there is a period that customer has to be buying products for you to get back your payback, right? Till that time, you don't make any profit, okay? And then the longer the customer keeps buying your products, the green zone is your customer lifetime value. So you should also look at the break even so that at least you recoup the cost, but then your customer, your business growth is all based on the green zone. And then, you can do your upselling and cross-selling by some incremental marketing revenues. And then you can see the curve also shoots up. So that way you'll be able to bump up your customer lifetime value. So now all of you may have a question, how much uh, should I spend on customer acquisition? So here is a metric from the industry that the customer lifetime value to the customer acquisition cost that ratio should be three or higher. So if you spend $100 on a customer, you should be able to get at least $300 back. So that ratio, if you can maintain, you will be profitable, okay? And obviously from this uh, curve, you also know this is the point of churn and the longer you can retain your customer through customer loyalty programs, uh, through innovative products, to better customer service, better customer engagement, customer experience, all those things matter, especially in the digital world, right? And customer is the king, whether they are very rude or whatever it is, you still have to have your support team trying to be good to the customer and say, yeah, we understand your problem, your frustration, we are here to resolve your problem, right? And Another thing that you'll also learn from customer analytics is you can also find out how you can minimize the customer acquisition cost. So that's what I said, like you, know, you can use all this marketing uh, segmentation analysis and do you want to target all your customers or you want to target the young buyers for this product because this product may be good to the young buyers. Then you can focus only on the young buyers of some demographics, some uh, buying capacity and then you'll be able to reduce your customer acquisition costs. The other ways of increasing customer lifetime value is obviously customer onboarding experience. So 
basically people, whether they come to your website to look at your products and services, even e-commerce site, you know, uh, how you place the content, the ease of navigation, the ease of finding the products, all these things matter. So if you are in e-commerce and a website, you know, you'll be doing what is called as the A-B testing, how you locate your content, how people are able to click those products. They're all very important. So this onboarding experience, whether it's pre-purchase or post-purchase, how you are able to make your customers feel happy, the, they, you are making them an ambassador and they make referrals for you. That's one strategy that I can recommend. The other one absolutely is customer support, outstanding support. More than anything, as, as I said, customer can be rude, uh, they can talk to you, they can shout, they can yell, but you have to empathize with your customer because they, you don't want your customer to have the buyer's remorse. Oh, why did I this product? Why did I buy this product? They should never feel it. Make them feel comfortable. And above all, here is a strategy that you can all do, which companies like airline industry, they always do. It's like, I remember once I was flying and uh, by Emirates, I had an economy class ticket, but when I was about to board, they said, you have been given a free upgrade to business class. Imagine on an international flight, I got a free upgrade from economy to business class. Surprise your customers. How do you do that? Some positive news free upgrades, free promotions, throw in something. Customers will always be delighted. And those customers will most likely be your loyal customers, most likely to buy your customers, most of products, most likely to refer your products. Okay. So um, we already had a question session. I would like to have a pause here. Yep, Dr. J, we have a couple of questions and sure. I wanted to let you get through your specific topic, but um, the first question is how to know and monitor who is visiting the web, their website. How do you do that? Well, um, that is something that uh, your, uh, uh, you know, your Google Analytics and all that, they are able to probably give you those information. You're getting your customer data, log data, your website, log data will tell you where the customers are coming from because it will be tracking your IP addresses, uh, the customer IP addresses, and those browsers where there is a cache, it also can catch some more customer data. And uh, you will be able to know where your customers are coming from. There are techniques available. Uh, obviously, you know, there are those data privacy issues. So if somebody is trying to disable their browser, from having cookies or things like that, maybe your site will be blocked. You don't want your customer to block your website, but you should be still able to track you know, where the customer is logged in from. So the log data from the website traffic or the mobile apps, um, all those things uh, you know, will give you some kind of information about the customer. Um, but the specific details of the customer is something that you typically get from uh, either your own uh, CRM systems or from third-party marketing uh, customers. So, so like at and Verizon, Google, you know, why are they facing some of this uh, public outcries? Because they are tracking some customer data and they are also selling some of this data to third-party marketing agencies. And so, yes, there are tools available that uh, you know, you'll be able to get uh, about your customers. Thanks, Dr. J. Um, I also wanted to mention that the Small Business Development Center, we do partner with Google. And so um, I would encourage uh, everyone to take a look at some of those upcoming webinars that we hold with them on a monthly basis. The next question is when calculating the NPS, are the passives counted as promoters or detractors or should they just be omitted altogether? Well, and that's a good question, but if you see the formula that I mentioned, the net promoter score is basically the difference between the promoters and the detractors. It is just promoters and the detractors. That is the only uh, thing that matters. So your passives, they don't kill your business, but at the same time, they're not also bumping up your net promoter score. Okay. So All you right. Can see the formula here. 
percentage promoters minus percentage detractors of the score. So your passes, they make no impact. They neither impact or uh, increase or decrease your numbers. And that's not good. I mean, you can say it's okay for you. Like as I said, an NPS score zero or above is good. But do you want to be good? Do you want to be better or do you want to be the best? That is your company's uh, strategy. Okay, we have more, uh, more questions coming in. The next one is, are there customer analytics nuances between a company that sells a product versus a company that provides a service? And they give the example such as an accounting or consulting firm, or perhaps a healthcare staffing firm. So in other words, what may be less online for the services firm? So kind of what's the difference between a product versus a service company? Uh, well, um, if it is a service company, like for example, software as a service, like now most of them, they run like the Netflix model, like it's subscription model. And probably like, no, you will not have too many detractors, but whenever there's a product, the product is always like, no, first of all, there's a learning curve with usage of the product. Then there is the uh, product issues. Then there is um, the product support. So the product uh, companies, hardware companies, they will have more impact with customer experience. Their net promoter square can go down, unlike uh, these, uh, you know, the digital content or the software-based companies. If that answers your question, I believe it does. Okay. So the next question is, what is a good way to collect and analyze data? And they go on to say, would a third-party subscription integrated into the website work or built into the website? Like, uh, and then a lot of different questions, Google Analytics, how would these systems communicate with each other to have data that is useful and robust enough to set strategies? Okay, my, my recommendation is, you know, um, data privacy is becoming a big issue. If you see the European uh, countries are all trying to go very tough on Google and other companies. So when you're trying to buy pro you know, data from third party, first of all is, you know, you don't know the veracity of the data and how much you can use and all those privacy issues. But if you can collect data from your own channels, your own website, mobile apps or devices, and you have the permission of the customer, then the data is relevant, reliable, and you have taken it with your permission of the customer and you own the data. So data is the new oil I said. So you should try to own the data as much as you can because the data is your biggest asset, okay? And so that is what I would recommend. You can take it, help from third party companies, or, but they all have to integrate and they have to channelize through your own internal systems and platforms so that you own the data. And you, know, you can look at your historical data for the last 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and that's your um, asset for the company. Okay, and then finally, the last question is what a customer portal or slash account integrated into the website, omit the need to track an IP address? Typically they are all tracked. I, I see like you know, today you can open any uh, browser on your mobile app and at the bottom you will see, you know, your, uh, uh, your IP address is this one. So it is uh, showing what IP address a uh, uh, you know, customer is trying to access the information. Uh, and so it is automatically tracked. The only way is you can try to uh, mask them if you want, but by default, all the IP addresses are getting tracked. And that's where people use you know, the VPN and other security systems to probably you know, hide them. But yeah, IP addresses are being tracked. Um, and that's one of the reasons why people are able to hack into some of the systems. Okay, and then uh, an additional question. How do you adjust for VPN? Is that? Well, that's something uh, part of the cybersecurity part of it. Uh, it's beyond the scope of this uh, lecture. But yeah, everything is all about uh, you know, how uh, 
first of all is like you know, if you are selling your products as an e-commerce site you no know, you should have secured uh, site which i am going to tell you why people abandon the cart uh, so you have to make the customer feel safe when they browse your website or the mobile app and uh, then you are able to track all those data and the vpn all these things is all about like you no know, even if the customer enables the vpn how will they be able to get access to your mobile app or customer that is what you should be focused on because you want the customer to visit your site browse through products make the sale and be happy with your uh, products and services thanks dr j that's all the questions we have so far and i thanks. just wanted to mention too if someone would like to um, ask the question themselves rather than putting in the chat. All you have to do is uh, let me know and I can unmute you. Thank you. Thank you. So now that uh, I've given you, I mean, I'm really, uh, I want to thank all the participants for those questions. Like, you know, they're all eye openers. These are real questions, real world problems. So I'm very happy. I, more than, you know, giving what I have yet for you i would like to interact and answer your questions because your take home will be more valuable when i will be able to you know answer your specific questions related to your industry or your business model so now having seen all those uh, customer metrics the process involved how do you set up your customer analytics projects initiatives so the framework is broad, broadly in three steps first know your customer okay and how do you know that like you need to know who are your target customers you now are you going to be you know just buying uh, customer data from a third party they will give you a million customer list is it going to be useful to you so you have to carry out some meaningful analysis to group those customers and then choose what target audience are useful for our company's products and services okay and for this you have to know the customer history what products they buy their demographics what touch points they use somebody said how do i send it to is sell my item to young buyers young buyers tiktok instagram that is the go to channels okay but generally people like facebook or you know they can buy from online etc uh, or uh, amazon prime or whatever it is so your touch points your access channels okay now if you have your own e-commerce site you must have people coming in from google search and land on your website so how do you improve your uh, uh, website rating that search engine optimization which uh, spdc probably can help you how to you know showcase your websites and be in the top uh, list of the first page uh, google page ranking all those things right but you need to know what products they buy what channels they use what are the preferences do they use instagram facebook foursquare or you no know, general e-commerce site and will they buy online or offline that's very important so know your customers and then you start collecting data okay the data is coming from websites your uh, point of sale your online purchases your email clicks right you, when you have an email marketing campaign you want people to click those links now those links have to be secure okay you should have uh, you should ensure that your email is not getting into the spam folder right so keep careful with those things and then click email clicks can land on your website and they can make uh, purchases and browsing then mobile app activities that's another active that browsing behavior uh, of the customer blog communities many people are using blogs to sell products and services that's important another data social media data probably one of the biggest sources right then your crm systems you can have a salesforce you can have any other uh, system you know for your customer relationship management that's very very important and then of course your internal and external databases uh, your data warehouses or any file systems whatever you use all this is your data points data sources and then you start your analysis analytics and you define your outcomes based on whether it's a descriptive analysis what happened diagnostic why it happened predictive 
what will be the future sales? What will be the sales for the next quarter, next to three quarters like that? That's all predictive. But for your sales to be this much, like if you're forecasting your demand for your products, what proactive steps you have to run, what promotions you may have to run, that's your prescriptive. So these are all the components of your analytics framework. And uh, let's look at the step one, which is descriptive analytics. So descriptive analytics always is basically you look at your historical data and then you want to see how are we performing? How are we doing? Okay. And then how do we identify our target customers? Because that's your step one, right? And so for targeting customers, especially marketing uh, people, they always use what is called as customer segmentation. It's basically you're trying to group your um, customer data into clusters or groups, and then you segment your customer. Like, as I said, airline industry, they can put all their flyer data and they can see the most frequent uh, flyers. They can see the least frequent flyers, and then they can also find some occasional flyers or flyers who fly during the vacation, summer vacations or during Thanksgiving breaks. So the, that's the kind of segmentation analysis that you will be able to do that. So we use what is called as a clustering technique. Here is a project one of our students have done as part of the graduation capstone. And the company, uh, the student work was, they were in, involved in nutrition, skin care, hair care, and all those products. So their analytics uh, goal was how to have the customer spend at least $125 a month average sales and the strategy is to form additional products that they can bundle you now they want to run some promotions bundled promotions at 125 dollars per month subscription or higher where they can combine product families based on customer segmentation so you can bundle uh, product xyz into one set of customer audience products four and five to another segment. Okay, so somebody had this question about pet customers, right? How we can, you can segment and you can send, like Apple can sell iPhone to a set of customers. They can send the Mac because Macs are very expensive, right? So they can sell that to another set of customers. So you can choose a few clusters or segments and then you can run your campus. And not only that, what this analytics will help you is like, you know, you will be able to tailor your product offering to those customer segments based on their preferences, okay, and needs. People said, how do I showcase my product based on the customer needs? So from the data, it is able to segment them based on the customer needs and preferences, and you get your segment, and then you uh, personalize your products and bundles promotions to these audiences. And then, of course, the company is able to you know, spend, make them spend at least $125 or more by those bundled promotions. And what they did in this case was to analyze one year of purchase data. They looked at customer purchase data for a year to understand what are the attributes which contribute to grouping these customers into various segments. So, the segmentation analysis is what I call as the go-to strategy for marketing campaigns. This is the kickstart. This is where you start your uh, marketing campaign uh, strategy. And uh, you will be able to segment them based on customer demographics, their desires, their motivation to buy products. And companies always you know your internal data is not sufficient because you, you're not going to know about all those customers who are available in the marketplace. So you buy some third-party data, customer data, you blend it with your transactional data and your internal data, and then you'll be able to do the customer segmentation analysis. So here are some of the visual charts. And uh, you know, we were able to do about five customers. Let me summarize all the five customer segments here from this analysis. So segment one showed that these are preferred customers, preferred customers who did not order in the last 90 days. Now, unfortunately, they are your preferred customers. You 
if you are if they are not making any purchase in the 90 days what is not happening is your uh, product shelf life is 90 day consumption that they are not able to buy okay so maybe they bought 90 day supply so they did not buy anything for 90 days so you have to see um, how you can focus on that not only that it is also a lower volume and uh, they, they are also more recently uh, joined customers so if they are new customers you have to really see how you can engage your customers, how you can make them uh, interact with your websites, products, and make more purchases. But let's look at this segment six. Here are these customers who are distributors who have ordered in the last 90 days. They are long-term customers and higher volume. So obviously, this is an area where you should be able to really multiply your business and see how you can showcase more products and uh, you know, make them buy more and more. So you have different segments. I don't want to go through each one of them, but this is how you'll be able to do the segmentation. And then your company C-level executives, your marketing, your advertising teams, they can decide and say, which customer I'm going to focus on. And then you run your targeted campaigns, email campaigns, you can send out flyers, you can send out coupons, you can you know, give coupons on their mobile devices, everything like that you will be able to throw them and you can see here what we do in customer segmentation at the bottom you see all the customer are there together but through this segmentation you are able to group like-minded customers into one group and then the marketing can go and say you know i'm going to be choosing the blue audience they are my target audience because they are uh, customers who are willing to spend a thousand dollar and uh, these customers are also in the age group of like you know, 15 to 25 and our products align with their uh, likings and this is where I want to focus on, okay? So these are the kind of things that uh, you'll be able to make uh, from the analysis. Now, having seen the descriptive, now let's look at the predictive part of it. Like you know, analytics is always about looking at your historical data, historical past, knowing your customer, but then how can you uh, prepare for a better outcome, better future sales and revenue? So predictive analytics. Here is another project one of our students have done is companies like banks, financial institutions, mortgage companies, before they give a loan, a house mortgage, or they give you a credit card, you now they look at your FICO scores and they look at all those metrics, right? And then they make a decision whether they can give you a credit card. Even if they give a credit card, like you and I can apply for a credit card, I can get a credit card with a $5,000 credit limit, you can get a credit card with $20,000 credit limit. So each one of us may have different uh, you know, profiles and how do they make those predictions? This is how they can make predictions. They use machine learning techniques, which can you know, train the data and evaluate and then those models are used by uh, financial companies, especially uh, all of you will also understand, like, especially if you're doing e-commerce sales, you have a big risk, which is a customer is buying your product, they're paying through credit cards. Now, they have spent, say, $500. Now, the customer has got a zero risk because credit card companies are able to call the customer and say, hey, you know, your card was used. Did you use $500? They say, no, okay. We have frozen your card, you can't use it, but you're protected, zero liability. But you as a merchant, you have a problem. Your company has to, credit card company has to pay you. So how do you, how do you get protected? Again, credit card companies can also protect you because they do real time fraud alert systems, right? How do they do? They use all these predictive machine learning techniques and you know, they are able to find out whether the transaction is a fraudulent one or a genuine one. Uh, even if they have a doubt, they will call you and say, then you say, yeah, I did authorize this sales. Then they allow the transaction to go through. So the buyer is protected, the seller is protected, the credit card companies also try to mitigate the risk. All this is because of what we call as predictive analytics, okay? And so as I said, whether your credit card approval, your fraud detection, even banks, when they're running uh, loan promotions, they want to know how likely the customer is going to pay or not, and they can make 
uh, a recommendation on their loan applications, okay? So not only that, in this case, when we analyze, we found out what are those variables? What are the parameters of interest? So here you can see the customer uh, interest, customer input variables, which really help to predict the loan approval process or whether the customer would pay the loan or default. One is the net delay in months, like how much of uh, delay the customer is uh, doing right now with his current loans or credit card payments. Then what is the net paid amount? Like what is the debt to the uh, uh, availability ratio? Like if uh, the credit card is uh, maxed out like $20,000, you're maxed out and you're paying $200 a month, that's a very high risk customer. So all those things uh, matter. And then the age of the customer, like if you're a new employee, now you have 20, 30 years of service, that's fine. But then imagine if you're going to be granting a 500,000 house loan to a customer who is about to retire, then the age may be a factor. In some cases, education can also be a factor. So these are all the, when we did the analysis, these are all the parameters we found influence the loan sanction or the credit card approval. So, and we also saw the default uh, payment ratio is about 22.25%. So about 22% of the customers, they default on the payment. So you get all this ahead of time before you can even sanction the loan or the credit card. And we used some machine learning techniques like decision tree, neural networks, logistic regression. I don't want to go into all these details, but there are those predictive models, machine learning techniques that you can use. And then you see our model showed the, the factor that is most important for finding out whether the customer would default or not is net delay in months, which is what our exploration also showed. So this is what is called as a decision tree. So you can make, look at this tree and you can make a decision. The next factor which influences the credit card approval is what is the outstanding OEs the customer has. So this is mapping with what we predicted from the descriptive analytics. And here are our models that I wanted to show it to you. And uh, we have another 10 minutes, so I will quickly rush through the other case studies that you will be all interested. Most of you, e-commerce, I'm sure you may be aware of, market basket analysis. So what do I do? When I go into say Target or Costco or Walmart, I go pick up egg, milk, and bread. So you can look at the customer's purchasing patterns, what items they buy together. And if you see from the transactional data, the point of sale data, if you see customers are predominantly buying these two, three items, okay? Like an eyeliner with other stuff and all that. So you can bundle them together. And so a customer walking in is an hurry, they go grab milk, bread, eggs, butter, and then they check out. So this is what we call as bundling or market basket analysis. This is a great strategy. If you can do this, you'll be able to run bundled promotions. You can target, they use this to even put it in the shelves nearby. Imagine a target store or a Costco, two big stores, right? You have milk in one corner, you have bread in another corner, customer gets dejected, they just pick up milk and walk away. Instead, you can shelf all these items next to each other so that you can go grab them, check out, like a get-go store. You can go and check them out. So that's very important market basket analysis that retail industry especially will be able to use that. And then of course, um, the sentiment analysis, customer reviews, right? So look at your customer reviews from whether it's Amazon Prime or your own website, try to understand the customers. So here is a, a simple review. The pizza is really good here, but the service was slow. So you know the positives, you know the negatives. Now, what are the positives? If your review says timely service, nice people, very helpful customer support, they're all positive, right? They're going to bump up your uh, sales and customer lifetime value. But the negatives, don't fix the issues, rude. Now, this will be a killer. If they see this on your e-commerce websites or on your prime uh, reviews, they're going to 
abandon their carts, they will walk away. Now let's look at a simple example of Dick's Sporting Goods because it's a, it's a Pittsburgh-based company, right? Look at their scores. Customer service, terrible customer service has got dominance, but look at the communication. Quick shipping, great shipping, communication. So this is what I call as text analytics, or you can do text classification, you can do sentiment analysis. These are all very, very important that, uh, especially in the big data, where the data is coming from social media, uh, online sites, reviews, you have to have to have to invest in these uh, strategies, okay? And then some, some of you wanted to know the analytics. So Google Analytics, all of you may be aware of. The good thing with Google Analytics is it's free. There is a paid version called Analytics 360, but you can use the free version, Google Analytics. And then you can import data, you can connect to your Facebook, Instagram, uh, no, TikTok, whatever it is, and you can look at your customer audience, your segmentation, your audience profiles, age groups, which channels they are coming in from, where they are coming in from, all those things you'll be able to carry out. This is one example. Then you have um, the Salesforce, which has now bought Tableau. So uh, you can use Tableau, which is a very self-service tools. And I've given you some links here. Like if you want to look at the Net Promoter Score Insights, uh, you can go into the dashboard and uh, here is your Net Promoter Score. So you can look at the data. So this company is good, like about 68.5%. How likely are you to recommend us to your family and friends? You get this one. But look at the participation, 57,948 feedback. So that's a reasonably good survey data set, good sample. And here you can see the breakdown. Your promoter, 77%. So you can do your Tableau analytics. And uh, Tableau is not very expensive in my opinion, but you can always use the free version, check it out and see if it makes sense to you. And Salesforce has bought Tableau. So if you already have a Salesforce, you'll be able to uh, get the analytics part very easily. And you can see um, how the promoters have been over a period of time. And so these are all the simple examples that I wanted to quickly give it to you. Um, we are running out of time, so I will quickly navigate through the following slide. Now here is your Salesforce CRM survey from global customers. Just see how they have used customer analytics. For the sales team, they were able to improve their conversions by 30%. They were able to seize the deals by 15 and the win rate was 22%. Now let's look at the IT and technology companies. They were able to reduce the IT costs by 26%. Okay, it's a huge investment. And they were able to deploy uh, their software services much faster by about 45%. And let's look at uh, customer service. You are able to retain your customers by 27% by using Salesforce CRM tools. And your customer satisfaction improved by 30% and faster case resolution by 33%. So these are all very quick metrics. Now, this is what I thought all of you will be really interested in. And how many of you thought people go to e-commerce sites, they put all the items into the shopping cart, but they don't check out. The cart disbandonment or abandonment, look at the yearly losses. This is published literature, $4.6 trillion loss from online retailers worldwide. But of the 4.6 trillion, $260 billion can be recovered if you can just make your customer check out by resolving the problem. Could be website issues, could be product reviews, could be customer service issues. And because of that, the e-commerce brands have lost about $80 billion. Now let's look at where uh, this abandonment happens. The travel industry, obviously, I go to you know, Expedia.com and uh, I see the price, but immediately I do a Google search and I find some airline fare is much cheaper. So travel industries have got 81.1% abandoned. Finance industry, similarly, you're looking for a loan or something like that. Retail industry, 76% disbanded. Nonprofit, 76. Fashion industry, about 70%. Gaming industries for 65%. So 
how do you avoid the disbandment? How can you improve your uh, revenues by improving customer experience sales? So let's look at why people abandon their cars. Negative peer reviews. So your Amazon Prime or your online reviews, those things you have to take care, you have to resolve the issues. Maybe somebody had a uh, customer had an issue, but you resolve, you give a feedback to the customer and the customer must say, I'm very happy you got back to me. I'm going to buy your product. I'm going to recommend your product. Then a uh, good return policy, lack of good return policy. Everybody gives a 30 day policy. And if customers are forced to return within seven days or they lose the revenue, that's a problem. Then slow loading website. Now this website issues are a big killer. You know that. So you have to see that uh, it is mobile friendly and the sites are secure and they load fast. 59% customer not ready to purchase. So here is where you may have to throw in something, see that the customer makes the deal on that particular visit on your site. Hidden extra costs. I'll give you a personal example. I was about to order some flowers online and I saw it was like $30 uh, available for $19.99. I was very happy. But then when I check out, there is a service fee, there is a shipping fee. The item was $20, the add-on cost was $25. And I said, why would I pay $25? So that's another issue, hidden extra cost. Be upfront with the customer, right? From the checkout stage. And uh, required registration, make the shopping experience simple. Give a guest to check out. They don't have to give anything. Just capture their email so that you can send them a confirmation, an order confirmation, a shipping confirmation, right? And uh, sites are not deemed secure. As I said, make your website secure, make it uh, fast loading and all that. And the checkout process is too complicated. Like, you know, if you have too many things involved in checkout, that's a problem. And prices are too high, 25%. Today, online, customer is uh, able to get more information. They're able to compare, compare prices immediately. You can do a price match. That's one way you will be able to make the sale and slow delivery times. Now imagine you, know, you are shipping an item after one week or two weeks and all that, that could be a killer. But look at this um, abandonment rate. On desktop, customers who are doing shopping, online shopping through desktop, 70% abandoning cards. But on the mobile devices, because now it's not so easy to check out, 86%, okay? So you have to improve that experience. And on tablet, it's about 81%, okay? And um, finally, now if you want to bump up, convert your monthly uh, subscription customers into annual subscriptions, thereby you can reduce your customer churn, you can increase the cash flow because they're paying ahead of time, Predictable revenue, you know your customer is going to last for one year and probably three months before the renewal period, you start running uh, customer loyalty programs to retain them and renew, make them renew for one year or two years, right? And then make everything cost efficient for customers. And now in terms of trends, artificial intelligence, big data analytics, all these tools are available. Uh, even customer experience, you can have chat bots Okay, customer can come 24 seven. There are bots available uh, only when all their questions are answered and they still want a customer, then you have one customer rep who can assist them. So you can use all these uh, uh, tools which are available to you and the benefits of customer analytics. This is my final slide is because of customer analytics, you can reduce the churn, you can increase uh, your lifetime value, you can reduce your campaign costs using your segmentation, identify your target customers. Instead of running marketing flyers for 1 million customers, do a segmentation. You can get 300,000 customers and spend on 300,000 customers for marketing instead of 1 million customers, and then improve your turn uh, conversion rates. You can improve your customer engagement. How do you do that? Use personalized recommendations, as I said whether it's Amazon Prime or Netflix or Hulu, okay, uh, based on your view, they are going to make recommendations. What genre of films or shows do you be interested? And then they can also give non-personalized, like what are the top trending 
movies or products. Now, these are all the way you will be able to attract your customers, make them uh, make the purchase and retain your customers. And then doing all this, it increases your sales and revenue and your visibility. So with that, I want to conclude with this famous saying by uh, Bill Gates, which is your most unhappy customers are your greatest source of learning. If you really want to learn, you want to improve, you want to make improvements to your processes, your customer service report, your retention, your customer lifetime value, everything comes from your unhappy customers. Your happy customers are good. They are your ambassadors. You don't have to really focus too much of effort on them, but your unhappy customers are your biggest learning tools. And the more you do your customer analytics with those data, you will be a winner in the marketplace. So with that, I want to thank all the participants for giving me the opportunity to share my insights. And if you still have some questions, I'll be able to answer. Yeah, I'll give everybody a chance to pose some questions, raise their hand, whatever they need to. Um, as I have reminded everybody, we will be sharing the PowerPoints. Uh, I'll be sending those out in an email. Uh, we'll also be sharing the recording and uh, it'll take a little bit of time to process the recording. So it may be today, it may be tomorrow till we get there. Um, we, uh, I just wanna thank Dr. J uh, participating today in uh, SBDC day, uh, allowing us to host him and this great topic. And um, I would just encourage everyone, you know, if you have specific questions after today and um, you haven't connected with a small business development center, uh, please do. You'll be getting my information as well as information uh, of how you can become a client. If you're already a client and, you know, this presentation has sparked questions for you, I would encourage you to reach out to uh, your S Small Business Development Center. Uh, we have a lot of tools and resources and expertise throughout our network to help with uh, addressing some of the topics that were discussed today. So we do have a question. Um, Linda was asking, is this information in relation to the Masters of Analytics in, at Clarion? I guess I'm not quite sure. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. In fact, uh, the Master of uh, Data, Applied Data Analytics is a, a two-year program where students start learning right from creating databases, building uh, data warehousing, and then mining the data building the predictive models, visualizing the data, analyzing the big data, and then finally doing a capsule. This is application of analytics to uh, industries. So you could be an engineering company, it could be a small business, IT company, it could be a boutique, um, whatever it is, how you can apply analytics to customer, uh, knowing your customer. Then you've got retail analytics, okay? It could be any type of analytics. This is probably an outcome of uh, you know, what a graduate in analytics would do or what data scientists would be doing for companies. <clears throat> okay, awesome. Thanks, Dr. J. Uh, Thank I think I'm going, to, I'm going to conclude. And one quick reminder, I'll be sending out a survey and we, we uh, highly recommend and uh, request that you complete the survey. That's the only way for us to find out how much you've enjoyed today, as well as what other topics you're looking for in training. We're always looking to respond to your needs. So with that, Dr. J, thank you uh, to all of those with us. Thank you for attending today's webinar on customer analytics, and we'll look forward to seeing you at another training seminar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great much. day, everyone. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.